Before we can take a look at how to use and edit a site model, we need to first create a site model. In this chapter, we'll take a look at generating a site model from different types of source data. In other chapters, we'll explore the various techniques for importing and converting objects into valid 3D source data. In this chapter, we're going to focus on the most common workflows. First up is the concept of source data, or site model source data. This can come in a lot of different forms. Depending on the type of object, you might need to convert them or modify them a little further before you can actually use them to generate a 3D site model. 2D objects, such as polylines or polygons, like we're going to start with here, are commonly used to represent survey data. These require conversion before you can use them to create an actual site model. 3D polygons and 3D loci, in most cases, don't need any modification before being used. However, it's a good idea to verify the source data before generating the model. This can help avoid issues with the site model creation, but we'll cover that a bit later. As I said, we'll begin with the most common type of source data is uh, polylines or polygons. You can see here, these are just 2D polylines, and we have a few text objects here that came in with the import. We'll discuss the import process in another video, but in this chapter, we'll just start with these polys. And we can see here, if we zoom in a little bit, that we have text data, which is just these are simple text objects that are associated with each of these contours. So we know how high up in Z these contours are supposed to be. Don't get rid of this data if this is the only place you have it, because you will need it later. And then we'll take a closer look at the actual 2D polys themselves. You want to make sure that none of the 2D polys overlap or cross each other. If they do, we want to edit the object with the reshape tool from the basic palette and fix any issues we find. For instance, if we had this, this object here, and this was crossed, this wouldn't be valid. If we went ahead and went to try to create site model contours from this, it would make a mess. It would just, it would not know how to process this area since, let's see here, this is at eight, eight foot four inches, this is at seven foot six, and of course that can't happen in a site. So we'll go ahead and undo that here. Anything like that, you're gonna to wanna to fix before you actually create it. This one's relatively clean, but it still has a few problems that we're gonna address. The next most common problem is having multiple separate segments representing one contour. Um, if, now, that is fine. So for instance, we, the easiest way to check this is this. If you hover over these lines, you can see the pre-selection highlighting light up. But if you use the marquee, it'll light them up as soon as it goes completely over them. See how some of these contours are complete? little circles in here, but some of them are not. It stops right there and it's a separate contour. See how it's not contiguous and it has a little break right there? That's fine, but if we were to take all these objects and go ahead and give them elevations now, we would have to give an elevation for this and this one. And we don't want to do that. That's a lot of extra clicks. So the easiest way we can get around this, uh, usually, uh, if we just wanted to fix one of them, for instance, so we'll, we'll do a simple example first. If I select this object now, I don't know how many different points there might be on this one. I think it's only two, but what we can do is use edit, select connected objects, and that'll select all the various ones. There only happen to be two. We can see there's two here in the object info palette. It'll select any of the objects that are butted together end to end, where the end points snap together. Now, if since we have a large number of them, for instance here, if we zoom down, look down here, we can see all of these would have to be done that way. So we're not gonna click on every single one of these and do select connected objects and compose. Oh, by the way, we'll go ahead and show Compose. So if I did this manually, I'd click this one, click that one. I have both selected Modify and Compose. And you can see they go from wing one, two polylines to one polygon. That's the easiest way to combine them two together. Now, of course, you don't want to do certain things like you, you could use Modify Add Surface. That would also create a single object in some cases. In this one, it didn't because they don't have a fill. But if your objects had a fill, add surface would work, but then you would have to turn off the fill in order for this to work. Generally, you can skip that and just use compose. And of course, add solids would not work since polylines and polygons are not a solid object. So compose is what you're gonna wanna use to combine these together. Now, if we just select everything here, we have polylines and we have text objects. So if I go to modify and compose, Compose is going to do its best to try to select all those objects. And now let's take a look. There, see, I have to select all the way across and let go. And I can see they're all contiguous solid polylines, which is exactly what I want. That makes it the least work later on when I'm assigning heights to each of the individual ones. Now, in some cases, uh, that won't work perfectly because we'll go ahead and we'll make a fake situation here. So for instance, see how this text object is covering this? In some imports that you'll get, this line won't continue behind it, it'll actually be broken. So I'll intentionally just go ahead and split this line right here. Then I'll split that into two polylines. And then you might actually get a gap instead. So you might have something a little more like this on one end where you have a gap. 
where the line starts here. Oops, we'll go ahead and move this over. Starts here and ends here, but there's a gap in the middle. So if I selected both of these, I don't have a line going underneath this. If I were to move this text object away, I don't have that there. Now, don't delete the text object. Just go ahead and move it out of the way because we do want this later, so we can just budge this up here. But if these two objects were separate and we tried to use modify compose, it's just going to bonk and, and not do anything because there's two polygons and they don't connect. This is easily fixed by going here, connecting them, modify, compose. You can fix all your gaps at once and then, like we did before, do the composure all at the same time. You don't have to do them each one at a time. And that's only if you see gaps like that. Again, the trick where I um, zoomed out and then I use the uh, selection marquee to sort of slide over them to see if they were solid or not. That's the easiest trick I use to see if it's going to be clean or not. It's the quickest way to tell. You can start on the top left and go all the way over and go all the way down. You can see that they're contiguous, so we don't have to worry about that at all. Now we need to convert them, of course, from uh, 2D polys to 3D contours. So what we'll do is we'll select all the different polys. Go ahead and hover over here and select it. And just be careful of this. Most of the time, they'll all be polygons or they'll all be polylines. But as you can see here, I have 47 polygons selected. But a few of these items are still unhighlighted. That's because they're polylines instead of polygons. You can just hold shift down, hover the line, add them to the selection. That solves that problem. Then, uh, now if these had record data attached, they don't. You can see here in the data tab, there's nothing attached here. So if they had data, however, we'd be able to use a cool trick called uh, modify by record which can read a record field value from an individual object and assign an attribute. So if these objects had a record and it had their Z value stored in that record, we could automate this entire process. But that's a little uh, lucky of a scenario. A lot more often, you're going to have to uh, just have regular 2D data with nothing else attached. It might be a tracing. It might be a flat import. So we're going to go through the whole manual process. Uh, something I wanted to mention first. You're going to need to be able to see these contour labels at this zoom level because you won't be able to zoom after the fact. So we'll go ahead and select just the text objects. There we go. And I just flat out cheat and make those a much larger font so that I can see those. Yep, that'll work just fine. And then we'll go ahead and we'll select the objects again. Now there's a couple ways to do this. You can do this, there's a built-in automated way which sometimes helps and sometimes doesn't. So we'll go ahead and I'll show you what I mean. We'll get our uh, polylines and polygons selected. And we'll go to Landmark, Survey Input, 2D Polities to 3D Source Data. If you're an architect or design workspace, it might be under the uh, AEC menu. But by default, it'll, in Landmark, it'll be under Landmark Survey Input. We'll go ahead and activate that. Now, you'll notice we can edit these options, but we can't zoom anymore. That's why we made these contours large. It's, a, it's something to remember. Now, the starting elevation will be the lowest elevation uh, in this particular survey, and I happen to know that's, uh, let's see, 22 feet, 6 inches. Uh, the interval is the the uh, height difference between each contour, and for this it happens to be 10 inches. And for the segmentation length, if I had any curves here, which I think I might have a few because I had polylines, they have curves built into them, this is the m minimum segmentation that it's going to be allowed to do. Um, I think six inches should be fine for this but uh, the smaller you make it the more smooth your contours will be if they're particularly huge and you know a tiny little segment of them would be a mile then you would make this much larger for this at six inches is fine and then finally you get to choose whether you want it to make 3d polygons or make 3d loci i find polygons both of them will make a perfectly fine site model i just find that created 3d polygons are a little easier to visualize while we're doing this process we'll click okay and you'll notice something we can click next and it'll proceed to the next polygon. So this one that's selected here now is actually the negative 20. So this one should be down, oops, sorry, this one should be up to negative 20 inches flat. There we are, or negative 20 feet. Now you'll notice I didn't start at the very bottom. This automatic tool picks the contours in the order that it was drawn in. If you import it, you can't always control that. So now if I go to next, it's going to automatically increment this to 19.2, and you can see that that contour is done at 19.2. I can do the next one, 18.4. It's automatically made that one. And I can keep hitting next, and this will generally be right. Now, if you are doing this, uh, you don't need to, this is going to be pretty straightforward. Now, you don't need to do this uh, every single time. And you'll notice, see here, it's skipping the items that are in holes there. So I'll go ahead and just hit next for almost all of this. Giving us our contours. But now if I go to next, 
I suspect it'll just go ahead and skip them. I'm, it, you can choose whether you want to delete your original 2D polylines or not. I'm going to choose to not do that. Now, if that happened to work for you, perfectly fine. You can go on to the next steps. But uh, you notice that when I did it, we missed a few down here, and we missed some of these ringed ones in the middle here. So I'm going to show you how to do it manually, just in case the order, like for instance, my order was pretty sequential from the bottom to the top, depending on where you imported them from or if they came from multiple imports, that might not be the case. Here's the manual way on how to fix it if you want to just do it yourself. We'll again use select similar, get our object selected, and this time we're just going to go to modify, convert, and convert to 3D poly. That'll give us a group, we'll go ahead and ungroup that. And these will all be 3D polygons now, uh, all with uh, no Z height. So we can go ahead. And this this mode here, this would let you do it manually. So these are already a 3D polygon, and we know it eight, needs 18.4 for its height. We go to the Z value here, 18 feet, 4 inches for the height. And we would just simply go down the list and simply do all of them. That's all there is to it, really. Um, this, is a more, this is the most manual version of this process, but it is the... Uh, gives you the most control as well. So it's your call on how to do this. I won't make you sit and watch me do all these heights. I'll go ahead and do them and then we'll come back. There we are and I've gone through and I've converted them all for you. Now we'll go to, uh, I usually like to go to a fly overview and then just zoom out like this and see if I see any particularly odd anomalies. And it's usually easy to just check. I leave the text there. The text of course won't move but we can tell here. This looks a little lower than it should. I'll go ahead and select this object. We can see, ah, I put this in at 1510 instead of negative 510. So we'll go ahead and just remove that. Pop that right up to where it's supposed to be. This one looks a little unusual down here. It says that it's supposed to be 17 feet 6. We'll take a look. Ah, it was negative 17 6. So we'll go ahead and remove the negative. Put that back up. And that looks pretty neat. I think we have no anomalies here. Now, before we do this, uh, we've done a visual validation, but we also want to do an actual automated validation of the data. So we'll get in and we want to select all these 3D polys. And the command we're looking for is called validate 3D data. Uh, this will check to make sure that the 3D source data and make sure it doesn't have any dramatic errors. Uh, it'll check for duplicate 3D loci or polygons, which wouldn't be easy to see in this view manually by, with us. Um, it'll check for coincidental or vertically placed 3D data. We can usually see that sort of thing when we're using a flyover mode, but um, it's nice to just have an automated way of checking that rather than having to rely on your own gut instinct. And we'll also make sure that none of them cross each other in the source data. However, we pretty much checked that when we were doing 2D, so I think we'll be okay. But we'll go to the landmark menu, and we'll go to validate 3D data. No problems were found. Sounds good. And it... If, now, those two things we changed, the different heights, those wouldn't have been found to be a problem because it's assuming that the height you gave it is correct. It's just checking for overlapping and um, crossing different objects. That's really what it's checking for. And now we can get to the actual creating of the site model. Now, I think at this moment it should be perfectly fine for us to take our text. Now, I don't like to delete it. Um, I usually like to keep the text there, so I'm just going to go ahead and create a new class. I'll just call it contour text, and then I'll just turn that class off. I don't like to delete that kind of thing, just in case. So I'll just turn them off so it's not in the way. I, I like to keep everything if I can, and just pack it away in another class for later. And we'll go back, and normally we would have already had that data selected, but I wanted to clean up my text. We'll select the source data, and we just simply go to Landmark, Create Site Model. We'll discuss all the site model settings in the next chapter. So for now, we'll accept all the defaults, and we'll just click OK. We'll let that load. You can see it loading on the bottom right here, and we'll let that finish calculating. There we go. The source data is then processed, and a site model is generated based on the source data and the site model settings that we used. There we are. And in conclusion, we now have a 3D, which is, you can see right here if we go to flyover, as well as a 2D representation of our site model. And uh, in the next chapter, we'll look at the various site model settings as well as the different display options to control what we're seeing here.